Hello students of science, in this video we're going to talk about thermochemistry, the chemistry of heat. Thermochemistry is the study of the transfers of energy as heat that go with both chemical reactions and physical changes, like the burning of a match. That of course is going to be a chemical reaction that is going to release heat. Every process, whether it's a chemical or a physical change, is either going to gain or lose energy. In this case right here, this is something that is losing energy as heat. So it's chemical reactions producing all this soot and ash and all those other things, and of course a lot of heat is being given off and wasted. The sun, of course, is going to be going through a nuclear change there, but that is also going to be losing energy as heat. Of course, we use that as sunlight. In chemistry, we use something called a calorimeter to measure energy absorbed or released as heat. We'll go into that a little bit more later, but of course you essentially have a whole bunch of water here, and then that's going to be stirred. You have a thermometer, and you're going to measure the temperature before and after you're actually going to explode your little sample in there. Pure oxygen environment's going to burn very rapidly, and then you're going to measure how much did that water temperature change. There we can figure out the content of that. Temperature, of course, is just a measure of the average kinetic energy of the particles in a sample of matter. Here we have a cold sample of matter, here we have a hot sample of matter. Biggest difference, of course, these particles here are going to be moving faster, therefore they have more kinetic energy, and we measure this more kinetic energy as higher heat. More Ke in particles, higher temperature. The metric unit for heat or energy is the joule, not jowl, joule, capital J. Heat, of course, is the energy transferred between samples of matter with temperature differences. You're not going to get a lot of heat transferred between things with the same temperature because, you know, there's nothing really to transfer. But in this case right here, I have like a pan on a stove and there's fire underneath it. Heat is being transferred from this chemical reaction as the gas burns into the metal of the pan cooking whatever you have in there. Important to note, energy always moves from higher temperature to lower temperature. Cold air doesn't seep into your house when you open the door in the middle of winter. That heat is escaping. You're only letting in stuff that has less kinetic energy. Here we have sort of like a branding iron that's very hot. Heat was transferred into this, and of course if you put that on your skin, heat is going to be transferred out of that. It's not like cold goes into it and cold came out of it. Energy in the form of heat went to and out of it. Specific heat, C sub P, is the amount of energy, Q, that a substance can absorb or release per gram. So the equation that we're going to need to know, we're going to be seeing later, Q equals C sub P times M times delta T. So that's the energy is going to be equal to the specific heat, and this is unique for every substance, times the mass of that substance times the change in temperature there. With this, we can figure out how much something is going to change in temperature if we know how much energy has been put into it. So you should also say specific heat is the amount of energy required to raise the temperature of one gram of substance by one degree Celsius or one Kelvin. Different materials will store different amounts of heat energy. One kilogram of gold is not going to hold nearly as much energy as one kilogram of water when we're talking about heat. Water takes about 30 times longer to heat than gold, meaning it stores 30 times as much energy in the form of calories or joules in it. So water has a much higher specific heat than gold. Gold will heat up and cool down rapidly. Water, very, very slow. Think of it as almost like thermal inertia. Here we have some specific heats of some common materials, from all the way at the bottom here to lead to all the way up there at the top of water. So remember in our equation, Q equals C sub P times M times delta T. All of these here we're looking at are C sub P, so this is the specific heat. And you'll notice right at the top, one of the highest specific heat of any substances is going to be liquid water. Water takes a really long time to heat up, and water takes a really long time to cool down. This is why if you've ever bitten into a piece of pizza that was way too hot, the roof of your mouth is the one that gets burned, not your tongue. Why? There's more water in that cheese, and water takes a really long time to let all that heat energy out, and it can store a lot more. This is why it destroys your mouth. Is your hot pocket cold in the middle? It's frozen. <laughs> but it can be served boiling lava hot. <laughs> will it burn my mouth? It'll destroy your mouth. <laughs> Everything will taste like rubber for a month. All of the hot pocket. Hot pocket! Let's talk about enthalpy. The energy of a system is indicated by H, which means enthalpy, which you really can't directly measure. All you can really measure are changes in enthalpy. So we know how much energy the reactants have, we know how much the products really have, and the only reason we know this is because we can figure out the change in energy. This is my activation energy, but the delta H is the change in the enthalpy. That's what we can measure. So delta H is going to be measured as the enthalpy of the products minus the enthalpy of the reactants. If it's negative, we know heat energy was given off. If it's 
positive, we know heat energy went in. Enthalpy change is the amount of energy absorbed by a system as heat during the process at constant pressure. Here I have an enthalpy diagram. Here are my reactants and here are my products. And you'll notice that the delta H here is going to be negative. Now you might think that because it's negative that it's sort of like, you know, heat is being lost. In reality though, this is what you would call an exothermic reaction because heat is going to be given off. In an exothermic reaction, heat is given off, of course, but the delta H is going to be negative because you are going to be losing that energy as heat. An endothermic reaction is going to be kind of the opposite. The products are going to have more energy than the reactants do. So heat is absorbed in an endothermic reaction. It's going to be positive because we've almost gained energy here. We're now absorbing it. That's why the end result is that it's going to be a little bit colder. Enthalpy of a reaction is the quantity of energy transferred as heat. We sometimes call this the heat of reaction. So energy is stored in chemical bonds, sort of like these ones here, and released during a chemical reaction. Those are broken up into smaller, simpler, more stable compounds. The way I've been thinking of this endothermic versus exothermic is almost like money. So as I mentioned right here, in an exothermic reaction, heat is going to be given off. In an endothermic reaction, heat is going to be absorbed. And it almost seems backwards to me with a negative for exothermic and positive for endothermic. So think of it this way. Don't think of it in terms of like energy. Think of it in terms of pocket money. So in an exothermic reaction, money is almost given off. So your pocket amount is going to go down because you're more or less making it rain all that energy out right there. So exothermic reaction, that pocket money is going to go down. That's why it's going to be negative. So heat given off, money is given off. The amount that's in your pocket is kind of going away. In an endothermic reaction, same idea, but kind of the opposite. Money is going to be absorbed. So here I have kind of the exact opposite. It's not making it rain. It's sort of, I don't know, making it evaporate, going back up into the sky there. So an endothermic reaction is going to be pulling money out. So the energy is going to be going in. Your pocket amount is going to go up, so the money is going to be absorbed. Think of it in terms of money, and it's a little bit easier to follow why this one here is going to be negative, and this one is going to be positive. So we've got two main kinds of reactions. Exothermic, as I already mentioned, that's the one where it's, you know, you're losing that money, you're losing that energy as heat, making it rain, if you will. And the endothermic reactions that absorb heat. Those are the ones that's kind of the opposite of making it rain. It's the make it condense, I suppose, make it evaporate. So exothermic gives off heat, so you're losing energy. It's going to be negative. So here I have an exothermic reaction. Hydrogen plus oxygen is going to combust to form water, and so it's going to be 2H2O plus 483.6 kilojoules of energy. Of course, if we were to write this out, this would be hydrogen plus oxygen makes water, and we're going to say the delta H is going to be negative 483.6. It's going to be negative because, once again, think of it, you're losing that energy as heat. It's sort of being spent into the environment there. Endothermic, same idea here, so it's water plus that energy makes hydrogen and oxygen, but the correct way to write it would be water is going to break down to form hydrogen and oxygen, and the delta H is going to be positive. This one here is going to be the exact opposite. It's going to be positive because we're almost saving energy. We're saving money. We're, being, we're pulling that out of the environment, putting that into our pocket. The products of an exothermic reaction, something that burns, are usually going to be more stable than an endothermic reaction. So think like wood and oxygen. Unstable when you put them together. They want to burn. What you're left with at the end is carbon dioxide and water. Those are going to be much more stable. You can't really set fire to carbon dioxide or water. Those are pretty much at the bottom end for reactivity. So an exothermic reaction, which is going to be negative, you're left with very stable products. One note here, so I have kilojoules up here. Those are not for individual molecules. That's not like two molecules of hydrogen plus one molecule of oxygen is going to give off 483 kilojoules of heat. When we're talking about this, we're talking about moles. So two moles of hydrogen plus one mole of oxygen is going to give that 483.6 kilojoules. So not individual molecules, different than what we've seen with a lot of other stuff. So here's our exothermic reaction. The temperature is going to rise. The system is going to be losing energy as heat to the surroundings. Delta H going to be negative. So the temperature change is going to be positive, but the delta H is actually going to be negative. Endothermic reaction, the exact opposite. The system is absorbing heat. So the temperature falls, but the gain in energy is positive. You're getting that money back. So delta H going to be positive there because we're gaining it. Here, just a really fun example of an exothermic reaction giant giant gummy bear in a very reactive substance and yeah fire lots of fire spoke 
particles. Yeah, this is awesome, but don't try this at home. But yeah, very, very, very exothermic reaction. All right, so let's recap again. Here we have the exothermic reaction. The products are going to be much more stable than the reactants are, and the delta H is going to be negative because we're losing that energy. We're losing that money as heat. In the endothermic reaction, the exact opposite. The products are a lot more stable than the reactants are because that energy is being absorbed in my endothermic reaction. I'm pulling that money, pulling that heat out. So delta H is going to be positive in this case here.